Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to class. Um, we'll just begin with a word of prayer. Would someone be willing to pray for us before we begin? Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here for our class, we ask for your guidance and wisdom to be with us. Open our hearts and minds to receive your word with understanding. May our time together be fruitful, filled with insights and blessings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, sister. So uh, today we're going to be looking at the last chapter. I haven't put it on PowerPoint. Um, everyone, does everyone have their textbook with them? So you can just look at it uh, in your textbook. Um, so the first topic is Jesus God was what I was thinking we could uh, skip because you'll have already done the Christology class, right? So you'll have that kind of corrected. Uh, is that OK if we skip that question? Everyone all right with that? The first uh, first and second question is Jesus, God, and the Trinity. Is there anyone who wants to discuss that? If you all would like to, we can go through it. Anyone online who wants to? OK, so we'll skip those first two. If you would like to discuss it, just post in chat. And then we can uh, come back to it. Uh, so we'll go straight into question three, uh, the different titles for Jesus Christ. Uh, so we see that uh, there are many different titles that are used to describe who Jesus is. Um, and some of these titles refer to Jesus' sonship or the fact that he is begotten of God, he's the first of creation, the firstborn of creation. Uh, so how do we understand those terms? Is, does that mean that Jesus is part of the creation? Or is he, uh, what does it mean if it's saying the firstborn of creation? How do we understand that? Um, so let's just begin by reading Hebrews 4.3, if someone could read that for us. Hebrews 4 3 for we who have believed to enter the enter that rest as he has said so I sure in my breath they shall not enter my rest although the works were finished from the foundation of the world okay thank you so um in uh, we're just going to focus on that second part of Hebrews 4 3 his works have been finished since the creation of the world uh, so when we say that Jesus is the firstborn, we're not meaning to say that Jesus was created first and then the rest of creation came to being, uh, but that uh, God is outside of time, right? So we, what we read here, all his works were finished before the creation of the world. So before the world was created, God already knew everything that was going to happen. He knew that the fall was going to happen. He knew that Jesus uh, was going to come in and uh, that Jesus uh, would have to pay for the sins that Adam and Eve had uh, set off uh, as something that was going to pass on to all humanity. And so when we read about Jesus as the firstborn of creation, we are uh, basically saying in his humanity, he was the firstborn as in there was a new creation that began with Jesus. Right, So we see the comparison between Adam and between Jesus. Uh, Adam was the first created being, and Jesus was the first born in this new creation uh, that is part of God's kingdom. Okay, So he's the first son in that after him, we all are called sons and daughters of Christ. Okay, So that is where the term firstborn comes in. It doesn't mean that Jesus was created first and then the rest of us were created or the rest of the world was created. It's humanity and as a new creation, Jesus was the first and then all of us were sons who are adopted into the family of God. Whereas Jesus is the father, we are 
adopted. So Jesus is the only begotten, right? Uh, he's the only one who can claim that he is a direct son of God uh, through the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that whole thing of Mary conceiving by the Holy Spirit, uh, whereas all of us are begotten of human parents uh, and we are adopted into God's family through Jesus Christ. Okay, so does that uh, make sense? Is that clear? Any questions? No? It's all okay, everyone online? Make sense? Okay. Uh, we'll go into the next part, which is um, <clears throat> the gospel accounts and what seems to be contradictory gospel accounts. Uh, we look at three examples from this, um, or actually there are, yeah, there are five. We look at four of them, and one of them I'll just post something on Google Classroom uh, later today. Um, also, sorry, I forgot. Uh, I posted the the video was posted online yesterday. So sorry for the delay. I wanted to do it on Friday. Um, I had a problem with the recording. Uh, the video stopped in between, so I had to re-record and put it up and all of that. So it was uh, posted last night. Uh, so you can catch up with that. That is for your other class, the uh, New Testament survey. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so contradictory gospel accounts. Let's just um, look at the first example, the demoniac of Gadara or the Ger uh, Gerasenes, right? Um, so there are three accounts of this person who was demon-possessed. We see it in Matthew 8, in Mark 5, and in Luke 8. Now, we won't read each of those accounts, but... Okay, uh, online students, you are able to hear? I'll... Uh, are those online okay? You are able to hear me? Okay. Okay, so, um, yeah, in these three accounts of the demon-possessed uh, man, Matthew records two demon-possessed men, and Mark and Luke record one each. Uh, but if we look at other details of the story, everything else is exactly the same. They are all in the same place, that is, in uh, the Gerasenes. That's where Jesus goes and meets this demon-possessed man uh, or men. Uh, Jesus goes by boat. Those men live in a tomb. Um, they are uh, possessed by demons, the demons go into pigs, the pigs die. So all of those things uh, are the same in all three accounts. The only difference is that Matthew says there are two men, and Mark and Luke say that there is only one man. Um, so what can we conclude here? Is there an error in one of the gospel records? Or uh, were there two men, was there one man? One way we can look at it is... Uh, what we talked about earlier, the Gospels are written from different perspectives, right? So Mark and Luke may have focused on the one man because they wanted to tell the story of the one man and they wanted to emphasize Jesus's power over the demons. Uh, whereas Matthew uh, is talking from the perspective of uh, he, he records that there were two men. So that could be one of the difference just in perspectives. Uh, the other difference that some people talk about is that Mark 1, 21 to 28, has another demon-possessed man that he talks about. And so Matthew clubs these two stories together and talks about it as two demon-possessed men. This is another explanation that some people have given. Uh, but the main thing is that whether it's one man or two men, it's the story of Jesus' authority over uh, the demons. Okay, so that doesn't, that's the main 
point of the story, not about how many people there were. Uh, so just in that difference of numbers, it could be a perspective. Uh, what we, how we look at it is that it was just a difference of perspective because it was written by different people who were trying to make their point through the story. OK? Is that is that OK? Acceptable? Yes? <laughs> OK. Um, the next story we look at is the centurion and the nobleman. Um, maybe uh, we'll just read through these stories. Uh, Matthew 8, 5 to 13. If someone can read that for us. Matthew 8, 5 to 13. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is laying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go and he goes, and to another come and he comes, and to my servant do this and he does it. When Jesus heard it, it marveled and said to those who followed, as assuredly I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into an outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said, said to the centurion, Go your way, as and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Thank you. And we'll read uh, John 4, 46 to 54. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour where he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Okay, so uh, based on how we assess the previous story uh, of the demoniac, would you say, what do you say about these two stories? Are they the same story? Uh, just given from different perspectives, or what do you think? Did you all pay attention to all of the details in the story? As we were reading. Yes, sister. Both uh, that they believed uh, Jesus, his word, and they were healed, although Jesus did not come personally and uh, heal. Only he sent his word and they were healed. Okay. But is it the same story uh, that both Matthew and uh, 
Matthew and John are uh, recounting, or are they two different stories? What do you think? Different stories. OK, why do you say that, sister? Because uh, one is a centurion, and one is this uh, other person, two different persons, sister. Two different persons, OK. Any other thoughts? Anyone else wants to add? I think only the place is the same place, Capernaum. Okay. The so in Matthew it's uh, Capernaum and in John it's Cana. Cana of Galilee. Yeah. Uh, John uh, forty six uh, uh, four forty six says who was sick at Capernaum. No? And there was a whose son lay sick at Capernaum. Okay. Uh, but Jesus is in Cana. Okay. And what does Matthew 8 say? In Matthew 8, it says Jesus entered Capernaum. Okay. Where uh, the centurion, it is about the servant, and here it is about some person's son. Yeah. So Likely, unlikely to be the same. Unlikely to be the same. OK. Yeah, so because there, there's actually no overlap between these stories. They're both stories of healing. They're both stories of somebody going to Jesus on behalf of somebody else who is not there with them. The sick person is not there with them. But the sick person gets healed wherever they are. Uh, but everything else is different. The place is different. The person is different. The relationship to the sick person is different. One is a servant. One is a son. So we, there is no necessity for us to say that these two are two, the same stories. But Matthew and John have given us completely different details. Instead, we just consider them as two different incidents completely. OK, so that's how we can also assess when we have two different accounts. We look at how much of an overlap is there. And uh, in that overlap, what are the things that are different? OK, are the things that are different very significant? Or are they just minor things that actually may just be a difference in how the uh, gospel writer has written the story? OK, uh, so this third one. I've actually already answered on the e-learning classroom because someone had posted a question about it. So we won't do it in class. What I'll do is I'll just copy that and post it on Google Classroom, and you all can read it there. OK, so this is about the uh, woman who anoints Jesus' uh, feet. In some stories, it's Jesus' feet. In some, it's Jesus' head. Um, <clears throat> so just read that up once I post it on Google Classroom. Uh, the next one we'll do is what was written on the cross. Uh, we see here, if we read um, these four accounts in the Gospels, each one of them says a slightly different thing. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews, the King of the Jews. This is the King of the Jews. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Uh, so again here, why is it that each of these Gospel writers wrote that sign differently. Uh, did they all not read the sign well and just uh, wrote the wrong thing when they were writing in their Gospels? Or is there some significance to this, to how they chose to, um, to recall what was written on the sign? OK, so if we look at it, there really is nothing um, contradictory in these. Things. All of them are saying that Jesus is the king of the Jews. But uh, John adds that Jesus was from Nazareth. OK? So uh, in this case, we don't, there's no need for us to worry that each of them said something different. If they were saying something completely opposite of the other gospel writer, then it's something for us to think about. But here, they're just saying the same thing in different words. And all of those things complement each other. So each of them give us a little more information or add something or take away something based on what was important in their record of the story. Uh, so this is also just like an incident of different perspectives or different focuses that they wanted to place on what was uh, posted on the cross above Jesus' head when he was crucified. OK? Um, 
Is that all right? Worldwide maximum, many, most places it's Indri, you know, in uh -huh. end, so that's the most uh, one which John uses. Yeah. That end. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and we see that the king of the Jews continues through all of them. Okay, so um, the last one is, did Jesus drink the sour wine when on the cross? Uh, so we have two verses mentioned here, Matthew 27, 34. Uh, it says, they gave him sour ma wine mingled with gall to drink. And when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Uh, on the other hand, John 19, 30 says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Uh, so one account says that he refused to drink the sour wine. The other one says that he actually drank it. Uh, but if we look at the, the sequence of events that happened on the cross, um, what Matthew is narrating is the sour wine that was given initially when Jesus was crucified. And the, the point of giving that wine was to numb the pain that they were feeling. So Jesus chose not to take that wine. Instead, he chose to bear that pain uh, that he was experiencing. He chose to bear it until he came to the end of his six hours on the cross. Okay, And then what John 19 is talking about is just before Jesus dies, again, he's thirsty. And this time, he asks for something to drink. And they give him wine. So he's doing it to quench his thirst rather than to numb the pain. And um, he quenches his thirst. And then he is able to make that last statement of, it is finished. And he breathes his last. Okay, so. These are two different times in the crucifixion when sour wine is given to Jesus. One time he uh, chooses not to take it. And in the end, he takes it for the purpose of making that final statement. OK. Um, do we have time? OK. Uh, so we look at the, with that, we come to the end of the gospel accounts and what are some different ways in which the gospel writers have recorded uh, similar events or the same events? Uh, we'll just look at the uh, at some difficult uh, things that are said in scripture that are a little difficult to understand. Uh, I think before the break, maybe we can just discuss this first one, and then we'll come back and continue from here. Um, so uh, John nineteen eight to twelve. If someone can read that for us, please. John chapter 19, verse 8. Therefore, when Pilate heard that uh, saying, he was more afraid and were again into the uh, praetor praetorium and uh, said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Verse 10. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not to know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Verse 11, Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Verse 12, From then on Pilate sought to release him, but the Jew cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not uh, Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks again Caesar. Thank you. So um, we see here uh, the mention of uh, in verse 11, Jesus says, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Uh, so what does it mean that one person has sinned more greatly than the other? Is it, does it mean that some sins are worse than others and some sins are OK, some sins are less uh, important or what uh, what do you all think what is it all sins are equal okay equal in what sense equal like equally bad or there's no there's no big or small sin. OK. So uh, what do you think here uh, when Jesus is saying the greater sin? What does that mean?
repeat the question uh, what does jesus mean by the greater sin if all sins are the same there's no bigger or smaller sin then what does it mean when jesus says this is a greater sin is he referring to judas the one yes he's referring to uh, judas uh, so we'll just uh, finish this sorry um so if you recall uh, there are certain times in uh, there's a time in the old testament and there's a time in the new testament when people sin and they fall dead immediately right you remember those two stories in the old testament and new testament uh there was at times when god's glory is revealed in much greater ways and so when sin enters it's dealt with immediately and in with great severity because god has just revealed his glory and people are already uh rejecting that and uh sinning in the same way judas was someone who had experienced jesus's ministry he was one of the chosen 12 uh he had walked with jesus lived with jesus seen jesus's ministry his life his uh everything he had been one of those disciples who had really witnessed the life and ministry of christ but he turns against jesus uh whereas pilot was not uh not in any way exposed to all that judas had right uh, all that revelation that judas had and he was just a person in authority who had a decision to make now he jesus is not saying that you're not sinning jesus is saying you are sinning but your sin is uh not as bad as judas's because judas has had a greater revelation okay so it's based on what was the revelation that was given to that person and what is the impact of the sin that they have done so because of judas's sin jesus is now standing before pilate uh because of judas's sin uh now jesus is going to be put to death but pilate only had that one decision to make on how he was going to use his authority okay so uh because of that we are saying based on the revelation based on the impact and what was the consequence of the person's sin uh it was greater on earth the the consequence of their sin on earth was greater but both of them the consequence of sin the wages of sin is death okay so that final eternal consequence is the same but what was the consequence of their sin on earth how it impacted uh them and the world uh would be greater for judas than it would be for pilate okay we can come back and um, address any questions if you have some but we'll just take a break now and uh, return in 10 minutes thank you